Hi, welcome to Ability Fierce. I'm Michael Astor. And today I don't have a guest, it's just me, and I'm going to explain to you what Ability Fierce is about and how we got here. Because we're at a crucial juncture where, you know, I don't make any money from doing these shows and um, I have to make money. And the reason I don't have money is because I spent my whole time trying to get my son into college. And the thing is that getting your son who has cerebral palsy, my son has cerebral palsy, into college is a full-time job. If I, if I wasn't unemployed, I wouldn't, he wouldn't be in college right now. But right now he's studying at SUNY Purchase and it's a beautiful thing that's happening. He has seven student aides, one professional live-in aid, and they're doing all this great stuff together. Tomorrow I'm going up to Saratoga Springs with Nick and two of his aides to explain to a bunch of people how we did it. And while I was researching this and looking at um, last summer, not this past summer, but the summer before 2018, I realized what a crazy time it was. Um, I was working for the Associated Press for 20 years and I got laid off in um, 2016. Um, my son said to me, I want to go and live away at college. Now this is a kid who can't get out of bed by himself, who can't dress by himself, who can't wash himself, go to the bathroom by himself, and he wants to go and live by himself at college. And I'm unemployed and I'm thinking, how on earth am I going to do this? But you know, I love him very much. And I said, you know, I'll do this. And the way I started to do it, because I really didn't have a clue, was I made a little film about him, introducing him to colleges in the world. And as I did this, I started to understand what we had been doing, raising him, trying to get him into the mainstream. So he wasn't in a special school, but he was in a regular school. And that's what he wanted more than anything, was to continue with the typical kids. And I believed in him, and I believed in that, so I tried to do it. So I f went to talk to all the different people who provide services in um, New York, and they didn't have a clue how to do it. Nobody knows how to do this. And this is a big problem, and one of the things Ability Fierce is trying to fix is that if you have a disabled kid, you often don't know what's available for the kid, where you can get the stuff, how to get the stuff, what it even means. It's very hard to understand, like you have to get a Medicaid waiver and you have to go through something called a front door. Between the time we applied for the Medicaid waiver and we got the first services, it was five years. That was five years that me and my wife didn't have any help to take care of um, Nicholas. And that was terrible. It, it destroyed our marriage. It, it did all sorts of created all sorts of problems. It was probably responsible for me getting laid off because I couldn't be that reporter who was always there, ready for the story, waiting late for something to break because I had a kid at home with cerebral palsy. But that's just part of it because when he wanted to go to college, we had to figure out how are we going to get aides who would help him to get out of bed, to eat, what happens in the middle of the night if he has to pee, um, what, how does he get to class? How does he get back? Uh, he can't even open the door, really. So this was terrifying. I think you could understand this was terrifying. Um, but I wanted to try to do it. And we found a program called Self-Direction. And Self-Direction is kind of interesting because it's not like the, the other alternatives, the agencies. You call the agency and say, I need somebody, and they send somebody. But they don't always send somebody good. They don't always send somebody smart. They don't always send somebody who arrives. Sometimes people don't show up. One summer, I had a person who was supposed to come five days a week, and he came two or three days a week. When I had to do other stuff, this was impossible because I can't leave my kid alone. And this is a problem that is affecting parents across the city, across the country, that when they don't have an aide or a helper come in, they lose a day at work. They, they can get fired. They, they have all sorts of problems with work because they don't have the supports that technically they're entitled to, that they should be getting. And so I was moving from this to a program called Self-Direction, which is a little different because we would have to find our Nicholas's aides and we would have to hire them ourselves. And, uh, and that's more complicated than it sounds because though we hire them, they have to be fingerprinted and cleared in their immigration status, and that takes months sometimes. 
So we were moving between this program and that program. And I went and I talked to everybody in Albany and I said, how do we do this? Let's get, I got everyone on board. I made sure it was going to work. And um, then we ran into a problem with purchase where they didn't want to give his caregiver, his living caregiver, uh, a separate room. They thought it was enough that they share a room between the two of them. And uh, I had to explain that this wasn't okay, that I'm not going to find somebody who wants to live with a boy who he's taking care of 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I mean, we've talked about this on the show, so you know that. But the fact that I even had to justify that, that I had to explain it, shows the problems with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Because the Americans with Disabilities Act is, in theory, very powerful. But there's no enforcement mechanism. There's no police. So what you get is you have to have a lawsuit. If we sued the school, we might have won. We might have lost. But it would have taken years, and Nick would have missed his freshman year. So I went, and I said, look, we have to have this. And I went to the press, and it worked. The New York Post did a story. The mayor tweeted about Nick, and the governor said, let him in. And we got Nick in. And we got Nick into the school, and we got, and he hired seven aides. There was a big problem where uh, the aides weren't cleared to work with Nick, even though they were already working with Nick. We couldn't pay them because they hadn't been fingerprinted. They hadn't been um, cleared for immigration, uh, which they had to do personally. And this created a whole big problem, but we made it work. And it's, it's a great story. And I made a little film about it called There, and there's all sorts of other things. But what I wanted to talk about was this made me angry. And it made me feel, if I have to do this, I don't want any other parent to have to do this. I think this is something that we should be able to make work for everybody. You have a kid with cerebral palsy with special needs and they want to go to college. It shouldn't mean that you have to have an unemployed parent who could do a full-time job just to get them in. So this is part of what Ability Fierce is about. Taking all those crazy ideas and things that sort of work on paper and saying, let's make them work in a way that people could really use them. And it doesn't destroy families. It doesn't destroy um, lives. And it doesn't mean people miss their jobs and can't be what they want to be. Hi, I'm Nick. I guess the guy who this presentation is all about. Ooh, that's me, just with a no haircut. In, I think it was like middle of high school, I decided that I want to go away to college. Um, and everybody thought I was crazy. When your son with cerebral palsy tells you he wants to go to college and live away, um, we well, want to do that for him. So we had to figure out how self-direction worked, how to get people into place, and nobody knew, nobody could tell us. They said, well, this is an adventure, we'll learn with you. The, this kind of test flight is not really reassuring to parents. <laughs> Because of Nicholas really wanting to make sure that he used students as his aides on campus, his decision is just remarkable. I would say that the student aides allow um, kind of more, uh, you're more integrated into the community. When you have like an adult, it, you'd be kind of off-putting to a bunch of teenagers who uh, don't necessarily want uh, adults like standing behind them all the time. They were thinking maybe like four aides. I convinced them to increase that number to seven because you are dealing with college students. They are there and they're different majors and they have their own activities and things like that. But knowing the level of care that he needs, if you can split that through more people, you'll never be left with everyone's busy on that Friday night. We hardly have any issues with coverage. We hardly have any issues with people not taking their shift or things like that, which a lot of people would think, oh, college students are unreliable or X, Y, and Z. That's not the case. You're able to help others and give someone support, and you're being beneficial to an individual's life. You're not like, wasting time. Like, like You're doing something that helps another person, which is very... Fulfilling. By having a variety of different students, uh, Nick has people that have all different interests. They have all different um, friend circles on campus, so that's allowed Nick to meet a lot more people. 
uh, it's allowed him to be engaged in a lot more activities. So it's like, sure, I might be the person you want to take with you to the Office of Disability Services meeting or to a meeting with your professor, but I'm probably not the person you're going to want to take to the party on Friday night. I'm proud to speak about Nick's GPA. What do you have? A 3.7. Nick has a 3.7 GPA. Um, so he's not just fully expanded his social life, his academic life is thriving as well. So how am I doing this? Well, I'm doing this show, and the idea with the show is usually I have a guest, and I take, have the guest come in, and I learn from the guest. And I'm putting it out on Brooklyn Free Speech Television because that's public access. This is to inform the public about what they should be able to know, which is the, the Medicaid waiver system, basically. And I learn, and they learn. And I'm also trying to look for people who need this kind of help. Um, other kids who aren't getting the, the services that they're entitled to, but for some reason they, it, the, the, it doesn't match up. They're trying to do something that is theoretically possible on paper, but when you try to do it, when you try to hire aides and you can't find aides, when you can't pay them, when they start cutting um, things, it's a big mess. And it's getting worse because they're starting to cut things. They're cutting something called CDPAP, which is a separate program from self-direction, but you could also access that to help pay your aides because self-direction won't cover the 24-hour, seven-day-a-week care Nick needs. But they're cutting that, and the guy that I got to go and help take care of Nick, he, he gets some money from that, and he gets some money from the other thing. When they start cutting the money, I can lose someone who could help Nick, and Nick would have to come back from college. This creates a lot of stress for the family, for Nick, for the, the aide who has a job, you know. And now there's something else called managed care. And managed care is like an insurance system where, um, you know, they, they insure. What happens with the insurance system is this. Most people aren't sick, but they pay. And then when somebody gets sick, it costs the insurance company a lot of money, but all the people who aren't sick uh, make up for that, and they're able to make a profit. Managed care is something like that, but there's a problem with the disabled community. Everybody in the disabled community needs services. They're not people who, who like, I'm not saying they're unwell, but they need what they need. It's not a question of, oh, only some people will need this kind of support once in a while. They need it all the time. So this insurance company model doesn't work. And it's, how do they make money? By denying services, by saying you don't really need that or you're getting too much. And people aren't getting too much. People really are asking for what they need. Where the fraud is, is not on the level of the people, of the patients, but of the agencies and the other people who are um, making money off of these disabled people and getting the money from the government. That's where most of the money seems to be wasted and where the inefficiencies are. And there's a million and one programs. There's so many programs. And it's just, it makes your brain hurt to try to understand all of them and how they fit together or don't fit together. So what I'm trying to do with Ability Fierce is make this all work. Let's talk, I often talk about email. When you send an email, you don't know about TCP, IP, protocols, you don't know about packet switching, it just works. It just gets to the person you're sending the email to. There's a lot of complicated stuff going on behind the scenes, but you don't have to know about that. You just have to know how to write the address and send it. And that's what I would like for services for disabled people. They get the services and they work. And then the complicated stuff, let's put that behind the scenes. And if the geniuses, uh, the financial geniuses, the 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 whatever kind of money people out there can save money on it, that's great. But they have to be judged on the level of service they provide and not on the cost of service. Uh, the head of the um, OPWDD, which is the Office for People with De Developmental um, Disorders, I think, um, he was uh, met with all these parents recently and he said, I have to cut, I don't have enough money. What does that mean? What does that mean for people who have a kid who's seriously um, disabled? When you're cutting this, you're not um, 
taking away something that is like a TV or something. You're taking away their lifeline, their support, their ability to be in the community or just live comfortably. And they're just saying kind of glibly like, well, there's no money there. There's money. It costs a lot of money. It's going, it's got to be done more efficiently, but you can't take, you can't not consider the human cost. The human cost has to be for, first and foremost. So it's like, is the patient getting the care that they need? Is it good quality care? Not just, you know, minimum care, but dignified care in a timely manner. I mean, that's sort of the motto that we're ensuring that disabled people get the kind of care they need in a dignified and timely manner. And it's not this, it shouldn't be this kind of like, oh, you're asking for a Cadillac and we're giving you a Kia. No, they should get something that's decent, just like everybody else. We should all get something that's decent and we should all not be stuck to the bare minimum. The ADA, um, so many um, universities, so many stores, so many institutions just want to be in compliance with the ADA, doing the bare minimum to be in compliance. And that's not really the idea of the ADA. It shouldn't be being in compliance, they should be fully accessible. They should be places where universities, stores, institutions should be places where disabled people could go and partake with everyone else. And when that happens, society is enriched by it. And a lot of other stuff happens too. If you have an accessible store, it's not just disabled people, it's elderly people, it's mothers with strollers. It, it, it creates, um, it raises everybody up. It raises us up as a society and it raises up the access that people have. The subways are a big problem. There's less than, I, I did a little thing about this a while ago, but I think it's less than 25% of the subways are accessible. Do you know what that means? It means that disabled people, people with movement issues, and old people and mothers with strollers can't get on what is the cheapest form of transportation around the city. And this should be something that should be fixed. It should be a priority, a number one priority. And we have to change the way of thinking to stop saying how much does it cost in terms of dollars into how much does it cost in terms of people. How much are people suffering because of this? How many hours of, of potential life are lost just with the frustrations of of an elevator that doesn't work or doesn't even exist. People who have to go two or three stops to get to a, to, um, a, a subway. And then there's Accessoride, which is this system that's supposed to replace the subway. But you have to call two days in advance. It doesn't come off in time. Sometimes it comes and then takes you on a long, circuitous trip and you don't get there. Um, and um, on time. And you, it, it takes the whole day often just to do something that would be very quick on the subway or by taxi. Then recently they started a pilot program with an e-hail for people who didn't need to get big wheelchairs and power chairs into the Accessoride. They were saving money. They could take regular taxis. Nicholas did this. And then all of a sudden one day it stopped working very well. It stopped working because they cut the price they were paying taxi drivers who took these people from Accessoride. They gave him a fixed rate instead of um, what the meter was running. So if a cabbie thought he was going to get stuck in rush hour traffic for an hour, he's not going to take a low rate. And this means hours and hours of waiting for cabs, when this is still much cheaper than the Accessoride, which doesn't even work. So the, the disability services are a million and one insults for most people. And it's, it, it's not saving money. It's a very costly system. It costs a lot of money. It's not being done in an efficient manner. And let's stop focusing on the cost and start focusing on the services. Is someone's life made better? Is someone included in the community? Does it work? And this is also, these are also jobs. And this is a big thing I've been hammering home for a while. We have to make caregiving a dignified job, a job you could be proud of, a job that you could go and take uh, a vacation and maybe even have a little cottage in the country or something. I know that's hard for anyone these days, but that's the kind of thing that we have to change it to because artificial intelligence is coming. And artificial intelligence is going to take away a lot of jobs. And the population is getting older. That's the one thing for certain. We're going to have more and more old people. And when you get older, 
you need help and people are going to need help so we have to create a system sort of like an uber system where uh, you have the people in the community who are cleared to work and help you maybe they don't want to work uh, seven days a week or five days a week or eight hour shifts maybe they could they, but they maybe need a few extra bucks maybe they could work three hours at night and help an old lady to cook and have her food and this strengthens the bonds of the community it brings money into the community and it helps the people who need help and this is the kind of society that we should be moving towards not the kind of society where we're um, making people suffer and punishing them for being disabled because it just makes us worse as a society and that's the kind of when I talk about this show I talk about promoting an abilities revolution and that's the point we have to stop looking at oh well this is the way it's done and we have to work within the system the system doesn't work it's time to look and say let's meet the goal of providing people dignified services in a timely manner and helping people and when we meet this goal all sorts of positive things start to happen these people become part of the community and that they contribute to the community. They create jobs. Nick is creating jobs at university. Um, and we also learn about other people with different abilities. And, you know, one of the things, um, I never planned to be a disability advocate. I never really thought about disability. But when it, it, but it could happen to you. It could happen to anyone. And one of the most amazing things about the disability community is how diverse it is. There were people from Pakistan, there were people from Zambia, there were rich people, there were poor people. Anyone can become disabled. And uh, that creates a, a, a really strong base. Uh, I've seen people who say that the dis disabled represent the largest minority. And if they could be weaponized to vote, and I'm not saying that voting is a weapon, but if they voted together, they would be a very powerful block. So we have to look at this as an asset, a resource, and we have to stop saying, oh, he's getting too much, or that guy, he doesn't look like he needs the help. Because nobody really wants the help. Nobody really wants an aide hanging around in their house who's not part of their family, who's not their friend. I mean, I'm not saying they're not friends necessarily, but what I'm saying is, when you have, when Nick gets an aide in the house, my daughter has a strange man in the house. I have a strange man in my house. We appreciate it because he's taking care of Nick who needs the help and I can't do it all the time, though I have for, you know, 19 years. Uh, but it's, it creates its own problems. So let's try to resolve this system and stop looking at like that Nick or anyone else is getting some special benefit. This is what they need to be part of society. And let's invite them into society and let's learn from them and let's make this a better society. And people laugh at me when I say this. And they laugh when I say that I want to do this so nobody else has to do this. But if I don't say this, who's going to say this? And if we don't do this, it's just going to be a lot of people suffering needlessly when we have the money, the means, the ability to take care of so many people and take care of so many of society's problems. So I don't know how much time I've run, but this has been my rant. It's a righteous rant. Uh, this is what I believe. And I hope you enjoyed this special episode of Ability Fierce where I don't have a guest. But um, next week, uh, actually, I'm not sure who's on next week, but I have a candidate for city council coming on. I believe she has lupus. Uh, you know, and this is, there are autoimmune diseases, there are Down syndrome, there's spinal cord injuries, there's, uh, there was polio, it's not so present anymore, there's cerebral palsy, there's all sorts of, there's autism is a big thing, and it, it, the autistic spectrum ranges very uh, widely, so you have a lot of different conditions, and you have conditions, rare conditions, conditions people haven't heard about, and let's embrace all these people and make their lives better and make our society better. So thank you for watching this episode of Ability Fierce. I know it's a little bit ranty and me talking a lot, but um, I think that's what I do best. And help me come watch, tell your friends, subscribe to us on YouTube, and um, 
social media and let's start an abilities revolution and let's make this you know a really great situation instead of something that's so tough for so many people thank you Welcome to Ability Fierce. To, on our next, uh, join us for our next episode of Ability Fierce, where I won't have a guest. I'm just going to be talking to you about what Ability Fierce is about, and that's about promoting an abilities revolution. What do I mean by that? I mean a situation where instead of saying how much do services and benefits cost for disabled people, we say how can we get them the best services in a timely and dignified manner. We're showing you the reality that the disability community faces.